Good day, my brothers and sisters. This is Pastor Nick. Welcome to Impact Church. It's a great pleasure to be together today as we look at God's Word. Um, you will remember that uh, we are doing a series of um, the reformers, the people who served the Lord post the exile period in Israel. Um, the leaders who came back with the people or who followed um, the initial waves of the people, the people who played a very strategic uh, role in um, restoring the nation of Israel and uh, establishing them afresh in the promised land. This is uh, no simple task. And uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of something so grand and significant. You will remember that the Lord had promised the Israelites that uh, after 70 years, he was going to bring them back and uh, he was going to fulfill his promises to them. He was going to console them and restore them and uh, to be part of this grand, glorious, divine mission is something to be truly appreciated. And I think in our day and our time, it's um, equivalent to being part of the proclamation of the gospel and bringing hope to the lost world and bringing people to the knowledge of the Savior and to reconciliation with God, and experiencing the fulfillment of the covenant that he has established through Christ Jesus. So there's a lot for us to learn from this period and the believers uh, who the Lord used at this time. You will remember that I mentioned a couple of people. Um, last week we saw the ministry of Haggai, the prophet, uh, who contributed a relatively short message, a series of messages, actually about four of them. Uh, that he delivered to Israel over a short period of time, and yet they were significant in shifting uh, the mood and, and, and changing the attitude among the people and causing them to rise up and uh, face the tasks and the challenges. His contemporary was um, uh, Zachariah, and we're going to spend some time looking at uh, Zachariah chapter 3 and chapter 4. There is a very interesting and exciting um, focus there. Uh, two messages for the two men who were part of this team. Um, so you had uh, Haggai and uh, Zachariah, and you also had um, Zerubbabel and Joshua, uh, who were on the administrative side of things. and. Uh, Later on, you had Ezra and uh, Nehemiah who helped to establish um, the people and uh, ground them in the word and also build um, the wall as uh, we see in the book of Nehemiah. But let us uh, take some time to um, read uh, a passage of scripture before we go into uh, Zechariah chapter 3 and 4. Uh, Ezra chapter Five, Ezra chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel son of Shiltiel and Jeshua, same variant for Joshua, son of Josadak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Now you notice that the uh, four people mentioned here, Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets, and um, Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua, uh, who uh, overseeing the work. Uh, Zerubbabel is the uh, administrator, he is the governor of uh, uh, 
uh, Judah, and um, he is uh, in charge of the political administration, um, and uh, Joshua is the high priest uh, in charge of uh, the spiritual administration or the spiritual leadership of the people. And the prophets are coming in to prophesy, to strengthen them, to encourage them. And they speak to them and, and preach to them, or prophesy to them. And um, uh, they were helping them according to verse 2. Now, why is it so important? Uh, because the building of the temple was not an easy thing. And yet uh, the house of the Lord was uh, supposed to be built. And um, so it faced a lot of opposition and stoppages and challenges. And it's always been like that. Uh, the building of the temple was not easy. If you go back to um, the time when Jesus uh, mentioned that uh, he was going to destroy the temple, um, you remember that the Jews were very unhappy and they, they challenged him because he said he was going to rebuild it in three days and they said this temple took 46 years to build and you are claiming to be able to rebuild it in three days it, it was a prized possession it was the pride of the nation it was something that they identified themselves with um, I don't know what you would uh, make it equivalent to it would be the Statue of Liberty um, uh, for the Americans or, or the Eiffel Tower, um, you know, it, it symbolized everything Jewish, you know, for them. It symbolized the covenant, it symbolized everything about their relationship with God. And um, it was a unique um, structure that um, drew a lot of attention uh, to the city of Jerusalem and and therefore uh, a prized possession. And so you would remember that uh, part of the reason why Jesus gets executed is because they they agreed, um, it was the position of the high priest, by the way, who said, don't you understand that one man should die so that you save uh, the, the rest? Um, because... Um, you, you don't want the Romans to come in and, and destroy this place. So, so the temple was guarded uh, with one's life, uh, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but what I want to draw our attention to here, I think which is very important, is that um, we see a team of contemporaries. I, I think I stressed this last week, um, there are no bigger people or bigger offices. There are people that God raises at the same time to tackle one cause, with different tasks and responsibilities. So there's a team of contemporaries. And we see this in the church also in Antioch in um, Acts chapter 16, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 13. Um, we are told that in the church in Antioch there were prophets and teachers. Uh, and while they were praying, uh, the Lord said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that uh, I have uh, called them. Uh, we don't see um, founding fathers here as, as we normally would see, or one prophet or one apostle. Uh, we see a group of leaders. Um, well, it, it is not disputable that uh, there probably were um, one or two people who were instrumental in setting up the original work, uh, but uh, they understood that uh, there was plurality in the work of the leadership of the ministry of, of God, and, and others came in, and uh, people like Barnabas, and Saul were missionaries. They had come from Jerusalem. Saul was coming from Tessus. And um, they had a part in this work uh, equally uh, in their different capacities as teachers and prophets. And um, they then set out on a mission uh, to do 
you know, gospel mission across the rest of Europe. And um, they got the support of the rest of the church and they are accountable to them when they come back. And um, so the church thrives and becomes a strong center for missions um, in Western uh, Europe. So um, they, they, they're certainly different roles, uh, but each is serving the other. And, and so these guys, Joshua and uh, Zerubbabel, are the ones who are in the forefront. They are the ones who are doing the administrative work, who are working directly with the people. But they are facing insurmountable challenges, uh, very difficult uh, circumstances and situations, and uh, they need help. And that's why we see that in, in chapter, in chapter um, 5 of uh, Ezra, uh, verse, verse 2, that the prophets were helping them. The prophets were helping them. So I want us to attend there. Uh, very quickly look at a couple of verses in each of those two chapters because I think there's something wonderful to learn about ministry and working with other people in the work that God has called us to serve in. And I, I think I really want to establish a strong point here that uh, uh, Christian ministry is, is always jointly and um, there is no one super amazing person um, regardless the anointing that they have in their life or the calling uh, they are called to set up um, room for the different others to participate and to serve the Lord um, you know together that's why you hear Peter saying um, you know serve the Lord's people um, you know as, as uh, shepherds not as uh, loading it over the flock uh, of God. So chapter 3 is focusing on Joshua and his challenges and limitations and troubles. And uh, chapter 4 is focusing on Zerubbabel um, and, and Zachariah um, after Haggai receives um, a message uh, for the both of these two men and he delivers those messages um, in in his prophecies and so let's turn to Zechariah chapter 3 and uh, let's read there from verse 1 then the Lord showed then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him the Lord said to Satan the Lord rebuke you Satan the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel the angel of the Lord said to those who were standing before him take off his filthy clothes then he said to Joshua see I have taken away your sin and I will put rich garments on you then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave his charge to Joshua, or this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, O High Priest Joshua, and you associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone I have set up in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone and I will engrave an inscription on it saying the Lord Almighty and I will remove the sin 
of this land in a single day. In that day, each one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. Then in chapter 4, if you turn um, to verse 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, almighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation for this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range throughout the earth. Then I asked the angel, What are these two olive trees on the right hand and on the left of the lampstand? Again I asked him, What are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes? that pour out golden oil. He replied, Do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Now, that's quite a long read, but I think it gives us the context um, of these two leaders who are in the thick of things and things really get stuck. So, Physically speaking, um, there were problems, there were people who were writing letters and there were letters that were coming in uh, because there was a change in government and uh, the work had been stopped and stalled and there were no resources, there were not enough people and, and it just became way too frustrating to, to build this work. The starting point was the temple and it just looked like it was not going to be happening um, fast and so Zachariah sees Joshua the high priest in a vision and he sees Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him you will always remember that um, there are two dimensions to reality there is what we see and what we know and what we cannot see and what we do not know stuff that uh, is real but is invisible and uh, we can only access it through revelation and through the eyes opened by the Spirit of God and so um, while things were stalled administratively and there were people writing letters and and so forth um, Zechariah sees that uh, there is actually a spiritual battle going on uh, and um, the issue here is that the enemy is leveling accusations against Joshua the high priest and um, you see the high priest was a representative of the people and uh, you know uh, that uh, from the Mosaic law, the Levitical priesthood uh, the priest was supposed to come in and make atonement for himself and then make atonement for the people and uh, if the priest was not acceptable he was not able to make atonement for the people and uh, so this is what seems to be happening here the frustration and the, the, the struggle that is going on with the building of the temple the manifestation of the resistance in the outward uh, is a result of a spiritual challenge uh, in in the in the heaven realms where uh, Joshua could not see but God opens the eyes of Zachariah to see that the enemy is accusing Joshua and he is accusing him he's standing on his right hand to accuse him and, and in verse 2, the Lord's response is very interesting. The Lord rebukes you, Satan. The NLT, the New Living Translation says, 
I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. I reject your accusation. I, I refuse to accept what you are saying against this man. He says, is he not a, 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 a stick, a burning stick snatched out of the fire? So, so the enemy wants to pull him out and extinguish him. Remember, if you pull out a log that's burning from the fire, you are able to extinguish it. You are able to put it out. And he says, I reject your accusations. Put him back. Um, you know, let that fire burn. Um, so, so the Lord rejects your accusations. And and um, while we're excited about that, I, I think um, there's something very interesting that we need to pay attention to. Why does the Lord reject the accusation? Because in verse three, we are told Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. Joshua is standing there in filthy clothes as he stands before the angel. And, and the priest, the requirement of uh, uh, the law of Moses was, was that the priest was supposed to wash himself and wash his clothes and dress up properly before he approaches the altar to make any sacrifices or approach the presence of God here to prepare himself, he had to cleanse himself outwardly. He had to cleanse himself inwardly. And so as he stands here, he stands disqualified to make any offering for anyone, for himself even. He stands um, unacceptable, you know, in the presence of the Lord with these filthy clothes. And so the enemy seizes that opportunity to accuse him. He says, look, he's wearing filthy clothes. He cannot stand in your presence. He doesn't qualify. And so the Lord's rejection of the accusation of the enemy is an act of grace, not merit on the part of the man, because we are told in verse 4, the Lord says, See, I have taken away your sin. This, this field, the clothes are symbolic of the sin in his life, the stuff that disqualifies him from standing in God's presence. And the Lord says, I have taken it away, and I will put on you, I will put rich garments on you. The Lord removes the sin out of his life and puts righteousness on him. He clothes him with a garment of righteousness so that he is able to stand in the presence of the Lord. And again, stressing that it is the Lord's doing, not by merit. He is not, he is not removing the clothes himself. The Lord is the one who rejects the accusation of the enemy and provides the the cleansing the, the removal of these dirty clothes and then provides him with rich garments so he is qualified by the lord to stand in his presence and not by himself and that speaks to a lot of us who are believers uh, who struggle from time to time with issues in our lives. And I know a lot of people who have been disqualified. And the, the enemy has come in and, and pointed out to them that they've done this, they've done that. Maybe uh, not the enemy, sometimes the church, uh, sometimes people uh, that we have hurt. And, and the, the accusations stick. It's, it's not that the enemy was just fabricating stories about him. He was wearing filthy clothes and he, he, the, the Lord says it was seen in his life and the Lord took it away and many of us who have stumbled and fallen and, and have done atrocious things and I I, I know Christians I, I, I know the stuff that we do sometimes you know stuff that if you heard about it you would you would shudder 
is, a, is, is that a Christian? Is, is that a believer? And the truth is, yes, it is. And um, the Lord knows our weaknesses. He, he knows our frailty. He knows um, our foolishness. And he knows sometimes the callousness and the rebellion of our heart. And so the heart, heart of the human being is calloused. Um, it, it's, it's desperately wicked, says, says Jeremiah. So he knows. He knows where we struggle. He knows our limitations and and our stumblings and our fallings and our failings. And yet he loves us and he still wants to use us. He doesn't want to replace us. He doesn't look for a new high priest. He takes this one with filthy garments, strips him of the filthy garments and replaces those garments with rich garments so that he who stood accused before the presence of the Lord stands qualified to represent God's people and God's presence. I want to speak to you today. I, I don't know what's been going on in your life. And, and some of us have disgraced ourselves. Some of us have stumbled and fallen. Some of us have gone back to our sins and, and like a dog that goes back to its vomit. And, and we are ashamed as we stand. We feel like we are totally disqualified. We feel like we are not worthy to stand before the Lord. Remember the prodigal son, when he came back to his father, uh, he said, I am not worthy. The, the sense of worthlessness consumed him, filled him, and, and he, did not, he did not want to even associate himself to his gracious father because he understood the extent to which he had messed up. But the father says, quick, put a new robe on him, put a ring on his finger, clothe him and let's make music and celebrate because here's the point the Lord accepts us wherever we come to him if we mess up it doesn't matter how badly you mess up a lot of Christians mess up and then they go away the enemy says God will never accept you it says you are disgraced you're useless and sometimes we feel rejected by uh, those who are responsible for us. Oh, we we don't accept correction. We we decide we we have done so badly. It's it's no use. As long as the Lord sits on His throne, there is no sin that He cannot atone for. There is no unrighteousness. There is no failing that He is unable to forgive. And there is no disqualification that He is unable to overturn so i want to encourage you maybe you are listening to me today and you are struggling and you have failed you have stumbled you have you have done um, very badly i want you to know and to be reminded that there is grace there is grace enough to help you and to heal you and to restore you and to put you back in your place and to fulfill the purposes of god for your life through you um, even in accordance to what God has in store for you. So there is the cleansing that happens here. And, and, and as I said, it's the rejection of the accusation is not because he is good, it's because the Lord is good. The man is bad, but the Lord is good. So uh, I, I love verse 5. Verse 5 says... Uh, um, then I say, this is now Zachariah, you know, chipping in with his own request for his fellow brother, Joshua. Put a clean turban on his head. This is to complete his look, his, his uniform as a priest uh, required that he cover his head uh, with a turban, a, a, a headdress, uh, specially designed for the priest. And, and, and he says, that's missing please put it on and the amazing thing is that there is compliance to that request that request is granted on his behalf put a clean turban on his head and um, they do that for him I want to challenge you to pray for people pray for people who have stumbled and fallen who have struggled Pray for people to be restored. 
pray for God to bring them back to where he intended for them to be. There, there are people you know started off well but are no longer walking well. There are people who, um, you know, have messed up along the way. Pray for them. And sometimes we get so disappointed, we, we, we become angry like the older brother in the prodigal son story uh, who, who has a record of all the things that this guy has done and, and he has squandered the money with prostitutes and he has wasted um, and, and how could he come back and we don't want him anymore and, and so forth. But pray for people to be restored. You know, a Christian who has stumbled, who has fallen, who has lost the way, pray for them. So when Zachariah sees that the struggle that this man is going through is as a result of the enemy, and the struggle that the nation is going through is as a result of the struggle of the leader, and um, the Lord is restoring him, he prays for a complete restoration. He says, he's not complete if he doesn't have a clean turban on his head. And when he prays like that, the, the wish is granted, the request is granted on his behalf. Pray for people to be restored. Pray for a complete restoration in people's lives. Verse 7, here comes the charge. Walk in obedience. And so, the Lord is not restoring us only to restore us. He's restoring us so that we may begin to walk in His ways. There is no goodness of the Lord, no restoration, no forgiveness that does not come with a requirement on us to walk right. Remember the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, John chapter 8. When no one was found to accuse him, Jesus says, uh, where are they, those that accuse you? She said, they are not here anymore. And he says, neither do I condemn you, but do not go and do not sin anymore. And it's important for us to understand that the Lord's restoration, the Lord's healing on our lives is so that we may not sin anymore, that we may walk in righteousness, that we may maintain integrity and walk in righteousness. So we hold ourselves accountable when we are restored. We hold ourselves accountable to Him. We commit ourselves to walking right. This is not a call to uh, try and uh, be religious uh, or, or, or act like the Pharisees. No, it's so that we may honor the Lord and appreciate how he has treated us. He has not treated us as our sins deserve. He says, O oh Lord, if you marked our transgressions, who would stand? But we thank you because with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. And so that is the challenge that um, uh, he gets, walk in obedience. And and it's an interesting, if you, let's, let's read verse 7. Um, this is what the Lord Almighty says, if you will walk in my ways. This is a man who has been cleansed from his wickedness and keep my requirements. Then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts and I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, O high priest Joshua, and, you associate, and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. It's very interesting that uh, we remember that. So walk in obedience and you will you will have an enduring ministry. You will have uh, something greater and valuable uh, in the kingdom of God. Unlike uh, is, in the case of Eli, uh, the, the priest before him who was rejected, who was, um, whose ministry was terminated because he failed to walk in obedience to the Lord in, in, in disciplining his children. It says, um, in verse 8, there is always something bigger than what you see and are presently engaged. And I think sometimes here's a challenge that many believers have. We only, always think about the work of the Lord in terms of what we want, what we 
what we see, what what is manifesting right now. Maybe something that we see around us. A lot of us formulate ministry around that, ministry aspirations around the things that we see in others and and uh, what we hear from others and and um, what we witness. And, and we, we like, that's what I want. But the Lord has something greater for us, um, you know, and he wants us to be consistent is our, our, our walk with him. He says, you are man symbolic of the things that are coming something to be faithful for something to um, endure for something to stand um, uh, and wait for the lord for there, there is an enduring priesthood he says you will stand in my courts you you will be in charge of my courts and and um, you'll be in charge as with this standing here um, you know, before you is is mentioning uh, the heavenly court. You know, the, those who serve before the Lord it says you you're going to have a ministry that is like like theirs. You know, and um, so there is an enduring ministry uh, of of um, priesthood in in the order of Melchizedek. You remember they they mentioned that this servant of the Lord who is called the branch will bring it to reality and we know that is Jesus and 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 so verse 9 uh, it says you see um, the stone I have set in front of Joshua these are the seven eyes and I will engrave the inscription on it it says I will remove the scene of the land in a single day what is he talking about here is saying to the priest while you are standing here um, your sins being removed so that you are able to make atonement for the people and, and you're serving in this context this is symbolic of the things to come and and the labor of the symbolism the repetitive process of atonement that had to be repeated year after year that waned off will end in Calvary it will end one day the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world will do so in one day and so he is pointing to him he said the things that you're doing here now if you're faithful they will usher you into something greater you are going to be a forerunner a predecessor of a ministry that is enduring what a great promise what a great um, ministry to be part of. What a great opportunity to be part of something way bigger than the repetitive processes that we have got. Way bigger than the manifestations of the grace of God that we see here. Uh, way bigger than um, the blessings that we saw run after and we love to testify about something bigger than that. Sharing with a brother of mine uh, today, um, that uh, a lot of people who said yes to the Lord and followed him um, to very difficult places um, didn't see the stuff that came after them. The missionaries who um, I remember uh, died, uh, one missionary I, I know about died two years after landing um, in, in Africa uh, as, as a missionary. Uh, he had longed for this thing all his life and and god opened the door when he was 60 years old and um, two years later he was dead and uh, how anticlimactic that would feel like that would look like and yet god has preserved that man's labor and work for nearly 130 years and thousands upon thousands and by multiplication millions of people have come to know the truth through that ministry so the lord uh, knows what he is doing but he, there are certain things that um, we sometimes are so consumed about that really don't matter so much there's something way bigger for which we ought to persevere for which we ought to suffer and and um, avail ourselves and endure this present time remember jesus the scripture says uh, he endured the cross and and the and the shame uh, for the joy that was set before him you know he knew that beyond the cross there was redemption there was there was mankind restored to god and 
and he endured that. And sometimes we, we are limited to the fulfillment of the present purposes and, and things that we can see and touch and, and we're excited about it. But God is always doing something beyond us, beyond our time, beyond our existence. So this is the message to Joshua, the message of cleansing, the message of restoration, the message of reassignment, the message of a second chance, the message of uh, God's grace and favor in his life. Then chapter four uh, presents the message to Zerubbabel. And um, he sees this vision of um, uh, lampstand and uh, two olive trees and, and connected uh, pipes and golden oil pouring in. And, and he's like, what's this? And verse six, um, I'm sure many of us are familiar with this one. Um, this, is, this is the... Um, uh, word of the Lord for Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is facing insurmountable pressure and challenges. He is at the end of his wits. He doesn't know what to do with the situation that he's facing. You know, sometimes when you have let a letter from the king and, and there's authority that has told you not to do this or not to do that, and you just don't know how to start re-engage you have at the end of the line and this is how Zerubbabel is feeling and the word comes to him and he says um, this is you remember Haggai said this is time to build the house and and so I'm sure they're like scratching their heads uh, you know how do we build the house and the word comes in and says not by might Zerubbabel not by power but by my spirit says the Lord this is the word for Zerubbabel you are the one who is in charge of this and you're the one who has received the message and you're asking yourself, how am I going to do this? It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. He says, this mountain that we see, this is what he saw, a huge mountain standing in front of him. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. So the impossible becomes possible. Remember Jesus saying, uh, when you have faith, you will say to this mountain, uh, be removed and cast into the sea. And it will, you remember Moses standing by the Red Sea and, and stretching forth his, his staff and the way being opened. Uh, remember Elijah uh, striking the water of the Jordan with his uh, cloak and, and the waters are opening. And, and so th th there is something that the Lord will do that is just beyond you and you have to believe him it is his mighty power and not your own strength so the mountain shall be removed and he says the, you remember in isaiah he says the zeal of the lord shall accomplish this the breakthrough um, in a glorious way shall be universal so the people will see this thing and they will celebrate uh, I, I don't know whether you noticed this in verse 7, then the second part of verse 7, then you, you, he will bring out the capstone. The capstone is for when you finish the building. He will bring the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. The people will rejoice. The people will be glad when they see the work of God. When your ministry begins to manifest and touch people's lives and serve them, they will rejoice because they realize that God has visited them and God has come into town. And says in verse 8, the word of the Lord came to me. Verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Now, this is an amazing thing because many times we start things and it's so hard to complete them. We start things and it becomes very difficult. They grow horns and thorns along the way and, and they start goring at us and they start stamping on us and we, we abandon them. We, we, we start off excited and, and it turns bitter, uh, you know, in our mouth as we go along. But he says, the hands of Zerubbabel started this thing and he will complete the task. 
he will complete the task that has been assigned to him. Why? Because the Lord is committed to you. Now, we would want for it to be so easy that I go from step A, B, C, and D, and then I'm done. Or go from number one to number seven without any hitch. But it doesn't work like that in real life. We will be tossed back and forth. We will struggle. We will stumble. We will fall. We will fail. We will be hurt. We will be angry. We will cry. And yet the Lord will fulfill that which he said he will do through us. The hands of Zerubbabel started. They will complete that which the Lord begins through us. Unless if you give up, unless if you walk away, unless if you if you abandon your task and assignment, you will not complete. But if you are faithful, if you endure, if you continue in faithfulness in serving the Lord, you will complete that which he has given you. And everything, as he says in his word, will work together for good. He will compound everything together and you will see the goodness of the Lord uh, through all the things that has happened have happened um, in your life. Nothing painful is there to be wasted. Nothing of a struggle is there just for you know harassing you. All of it turns into a testimony. All of it turns into the manifestation of the faithfulness and the goodness of God through our lives. Again, verse 10, if you read carefully there, it says, who despises the day of small things? Who despises the day of small beginnings? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, this is very interesting because there is progress here. You notice that God gives him the vision of the completion of the work. The they, they will rejoice when they see the capstone. Then he will bring the capstone to the shouts of God bless it, God bless it, verse 7. And then we back up to where it starts, and it starts very small with the plumb line. The plumb line is for measuring, is for laying the stones and for building. It's not the completion of the work. The plumb line is the beginning of the work. But the Lord already has spoken about the end and the completion of the task where the capstone is going to be uh, laid by the same hands. The same hands that laid the foundation stone are the same hands that will hold the plumb line and, and, and lead uh, the people in the building. These are the same hands that will bring the capstone and they will be rejoicing because of that. They will rejoice when they see the plumb line. They will, he will bring um, the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Bigger and more beautiful is not always better. I think many of us don't understand that. We always want something bigger. We always want something better. We always want something that looks like what others are doing. So we walk away from our stations in life. We walk away from our assignments. We walk away from our ministries. We walk away from the teams that God puts us with because we think that it's exciting on the other side and we see and we attempt to copy uh, what others are doing. But remember, we have to be faithful and a little. Begin where you are and do what you can and leave the results to God. Sometimes we're frustrated by small things. We want, we want things to move at a certain pace, and we, we, we want to follow a certain, um, you know, formula and and system. We, we, we have learned a lot of systems and 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 principles from everywhere in management, in the world, and of business and. Uh, it's, it's every day that you hear stories about, you know, how to attack it like the the soldiers do, like this navy seals, the special forces, and so forth. And and we we want we want stuff that is predictable, that follows a particular line, and we are not happy to pick up slow things. 
we're not happy to pick up things that seem to be erratic. We, we want to be always making progress. Um, progress as in, you know, incremental progress. But the Lord does not work like that. He, he works when we are obedient. When we are obedient. Um, there's something very interesting that I want to close uh, this reflection with in, in this in verse 13 and, and repeat it uh, from verse 5 actually. Um, please pay attention to this verse 13. He replied, so in verse 12 he asks who are these and what's going on here and he replied, do you not know what these are? No my lord, I said. And in verse 5, of chapter 4 he says the same thing he answered do you not know what these are no my lord i replied if you want to go far with god this is the attitude to to carry do you know do you not know what these are the answer is no i don't now i know we we treasure forensic prophets, you know, major prophets, those who are accurate to the T. Um, well, if, if it's a prophecy from the Lord, it just has to be accurate anyway. Uh, but um, so, so accuracy is not really a measure of whether you are a great prophet or not. If you are a prophet from God, you have to be accurate, you know. It's, common sense uh, but there are people who assume that if God uses you then you know everything and that's not true if God uses you then um, you are above um, you know any learning you, you, you are the one who is the go to source that's not true that's error the person who is the source is the Lord you will notice how the prophets in scripture speak the word of the lord came to me saying and last week we spoke about uh, haggai who spoke only 38 verses he could have written longer and, and tried to say more things no you speak only as you are told you speak only the words that come from the lord that's the job of the prophet nowadays the prophets they, they speak whatever they want because they are prophets in fact there are others who claim that they know much more than God well they're more gifted than God um, but a prophet is subject to the one who gives the prophetic word a prophet is subject to the one who sends him he is a messenger he is the a person who carries the word and you can't improve on the word you are not the source of the word you are the means through which the word comes so there is no prophet who is to be honored of themselves there's no prophet who is to be measured against other prophets If it is a prophet from the Lord, they simply are telling what the Lord has spoken to them. And in many instances in scripture, the prophet doesn't even know how to interpret the message. It's very interesting. Um, you know, there's a time when Agabus comes in and he ties Paul's hands with his belt and, and he says, this is what the Jews are going to do. And but he knows what to do with it should should he not go should he go and they are crying and they're saying don't go and so forth and finally paul says no this is this is confirmation that i should go because this is what the lord has been saying to me throughout every city um, so so i'm on the right track and and the lord confirms that when he's in jerusalem he says you've testified about me in Jerusalem so you will testify again in Rome so my brothers and sisters let's keep that open spirit that 
receives from the Lord that is hungry for God, that is not assuming that we have reached where we ought. Paul says, uh, this attitude I keep, I these things that are behind, I put them aside and I strain forward for those things that are before me to find out, uh, to take hold of that which for, for which uh, the Lord took hold of me. I, I don't want to act as if I've arrived, I, I've achieved stuff. And that is what I want to challenge us to do. So here is a team of people. Here is a message that comes from Zachariah to two of his colleagues who are in the forefront. He backs them up with words of encouragement. He says, the Lord is going to cleanse you and wash you, Joshua. And he says, the Lord is going to strengthen you and empower you by his spirit, my brother Zerubbabel. Strengthen your hands, be strong. They in, in Ezra, we read in chapter 5, we read the prophets were there strengthening them, encouraging them, building them up, motivating them. They were, they were speaking into difficult circumstances. They, they were initiating um, uh, uncharted territories. And they were saying, this is not just you dreaming about it. This is the Lord speaking into your life. Rise up and do it. Be faithful, O Zerubbabel. Be faithful, Joshua. Be consistent. Trust the Lord. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So I want to really encourage you, my brothers and sisters, that at this time, the Lord wants us to be sensitive to what he is doing. Um, he is working in this era, in this generation, and he's working through us and through others. We need to know when it's time to speak to others and encourage them. And we need to learn how to receive encouragement and strength. We need to be restored to the Lord. If you need restoration tonight or today, uh, whatever time it is that you're listening to me, um, is the day for you to be restored. Reach out to the Lord and say, Lord, restore me. Re restore me. Return me to the thing that you called me initially to. Maybe you're not clear about what the Lord wants you to do. Ask him for clarity. Uh, what should I be doing at this time in this season? Don't follow people. Don't try and, and, and you know, follow people's agenda. Uh, it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. The, 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 the anointing, the grace is in the Lord, not in people. The prophets are enablers. They encourage these men, they are not the source of the calling. And some of us are paying monies to people because we assume that they are the source of our anointing, they are the source of, of grace. They are not. It is the Lord who does all these things through us and in us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for my brothers and sisters and for the place where they are at now. There are some who like Joshua are standing accused because of their failings and their fallings and their faults. I ask that you will restore them, even as you have done, Joshua. Wash them clean, cleanse them. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes us, cleanses us from all sin. Say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We will stand before Him as if we have never sinned. Restore, my brothers and sisters, restore people who have stumbled and strayed, who the enemy has misled and and they have failed dismally. Maybe rejected by people, and yet we still want to use them. And there are some of us who are struggling, who are facing insurmountable tasks, and we just don't know how to get on with it. Grant us grace. Grant us help from above. May your spirit enable us. May your spirit come under our wings and be the wind 
that blows us forward. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray and thank you and glorify your name. Amen. God bless you and thank you for joining us today. And trust that you will be encouraged. You find strength in the Lord. Amen.